next. An apartment complex is the site of a brutal murder. She was stabbed multiple times. It looked like it was sexually motivated. How could someone do that? Why would someone do that? Police find a clue next to the body. During that struggle is when the button came off and fell to the ground. But who killed her? It was a sex crime, but that didn't limit it just to men. A jealous lover, an exotic dancer, an ex-husband, all had a possible motive. And the button held the key. Thirty-five-year-old Julianne Braun worked as a consumer loan officer in Fresno, California, helping people get car loans and mortgages. But that wasn't the only way she assisted others. If someone was hitchhiking down the road with a can in their hand for gas, she'd go, Mom, let's stop and pick them up. I said, Julie, are you crazy? And I used to tell her, you know, to just be careful. She was always positive. She never yelled at anybody. If you didn't get along with her, then there was something wrong with you because she was the nicest person in the whole world. Julie was always punctual. So when she didn't show up for work one Monday morning, it was cause for alarm. Julie's boss called and said she didn't come to work and she didn't call in. And I I just started shaking. I knew there was something wrong because Julie was not that kind of a person. Julie's mother went over to her daughter's apartment and found her body just inside the door. She had been stabbed to death. When my daughter died, it was like someone took a piece of my heart. Until it was my whole life. <laughs> the medical examiner estimated that Julie was murdered the night before her body was discovered. She had been stabbed 37 times. It appeared to be a sexually motivated crime, but oddly, there was no sexual assault. She was in her underwear, and there was just a massive amount of blood under her, around her. Um, it was obvious that there was a significant amount of physical damage to her body. Fortunately, Julie's two children weren't home when the crime occurred. They were with Julie's ex-husband. Robbery wasn't the motive. Julie's purse, with money and credit cards still inside, lay untouched on the kitchen counter. A possible murder weapon, a four-inch steak knife, was in the kitchen sink. But it was clean. There were no signs of forced entry. Was it possible Julie knew her killer? Everything pointed to whoever came in that apartment, came in uh, nonviolently, was allowed in. It wasn't something where they had forced their way in and attacked Julie. Police found some bloody shoe prints at the scene, one on Julie's body. When I saw that footprint, that told me an awful lot about who I was looking for. He showed exactly what he thought about what he did by just pushing her aside like she was nothing more than a piece of meat. Unfortunately, none of the shoe impressions could be used as evidence. With carpet, you can't tell the pattern of the shoe, but you could tell the form of a shoe print in the, uh, in the blood itself. In a search for suspects, Julie's apartment managers told police an unusual story. Three nights before the murder, the manager's wife was taking her nightly walk around the apartment grounds. A new tenant, a young man she barely knew, told her there was a broken window at the end of his hallway and he asked her to check it out. It's, it's, just it's down a dark walkway. He's persistent over and over. He asks, 
Come over here and take a look at it. Come over and take a look at it. She wants nothing to do with it. The manager's wife told that person that she would notify her husband, the manager. The next day, she checked. There was no broken window. For whatever reason that person had, that person wanted to take the apartment manager's wife into a very dark, very uh, secluded area of that apartment complex, and that raised a huge flag for us. We wanted to talk to that person. Coincidentally, the tenant was Julie's next-door neighbor. In a haunting irony, Julianne Braun chose her apartment complex because of its safety features. She specifically rented that place because of the security. They had security gate. You couldn't get in without a key to get, you know, the live key to get in. And uh, it was really a nice place. The apartment manager's wife told police to question Julie's next-door neighbor, a new tenant, 23-year-old Jeremy Overstreet. Jeremy lived with an exotic dancer named Holly Doyle. They met at the strip club where she worked. Overstreet was unemployed, and Holly said she found him articulate and attractive. She was kind-hearted, you know, felt sorry for him, you know, uh, things of that nature. You know, she brought him home. When questioned by police, Holly said Overstreet was home on the night Julie was murdered, and she saw no blood on his shirt when he came in. There were witnesses, people that had been over at Holly's apartment, he had gone back to the apartment instead of doing what he normally did, which was sit down, have some drinks, and continue to talk. Straight, went straight to a room, told people not to disturb him. He was tired. A background check revealed Overstreet had a criminal record. Jeremy had just been paroled. He had been incarcerated for a previous rape. But Overstreet violated the terms of his parole by moving to Fresno. Holly said Overstreet took off when he saw all the police around the apartment complex investigating Julie's murder. That by itself would have gotten him picked up by the first officer that found him. As police searched for Overstreet, another suspect emerged. I had no idea who would hurt my daughter. My first thought was her ex-husband. Investigators learned that Julie's ex-husband, John Braun, did something on the night of Julie's murder that he'd never done before. He didn't bring the children home to Julie's apartment as he had always done. He said there'd been a change of plan. It was strange because... He always took the boys home at 6 o'clock. That night, they had gotten back from the lake too late. I'm sure I was the first one they wanted to talk to. They were wondering, why were you late? Were, were you circling around? Did you come in and leave the boys somewhere? You know, why, why this night are you late? In addition, Police learned that John Braun was a few thousand dollars behind in child support payments. Could this have been a motive for murder? With no signs of forced entry into Julie's apartment, John was certainly someone Julie would have allowed in. When we have a homicide investigation, we look at everybody. Everybody could be and is a potential suspect. Anytime you're having a divorce situation where kids are involved and one half of that equation is getting on with life and getting into a new relationship, that gets volatile. And John Braun was moving forward. He was dating someone. It was getting serious. In fact, 
John's new girlfriend, Brenda Stanton, was another person police wanted to talk to. Julie would also have allowed Brenda into her apartment. There's nothing to say that it couldn't have been a female suspect that went in and did that. Brenda, a 32-year-old school teacher, had no criminal record. But three days before Julie's murder, Brenda and Julie got into a fight. Apparently, Brenda believed that Julie was trying to get back together with her ex-husband. We used to call his girlfriend Alvira. <laughs> and she said Alvira and her got into an argument, and John and her had gotten into an argument. And it was just one big mess. Go question her, too. We'll question everyone. I wanted to make sure that whoever did this got caught. Then, investigators found an important piece of evidence in Julie's apartment. About 18 inches to two feet west of where her head lay, I noticed a button, and it was just there on the carpet, right close to where her head is. The logo on the button, Eddie Bauer, 1920, was clearly visible. Strands of thread were hanging from the button, indicating it had been torn from a shirt. The button did not come from Julie's clothes or any of the blouses in her closet. That didn't just fall from somebody who might have visited her the day before. That was something that the killer left behind. According to the Eddie Bauer Company, the button found at Julianne Braun's crime scene could have come from a woman's blouse or a man's shirt. When questioned by police, Julie's ex-husband, John Braun, and his new girlfriend, Brenda Stanton, both denied owning an Eddie Bauer shirt. We had to find out who it belonged to, where it came from, we had to find a specific tie to this button, why it's there. Then, Julie's mother remembered something that Julie said to her on the phone the night she was killed. I'll remember that day forever. She says, Mom, let me call you back. I'm helping a neighbor right now. If that neighbor were Jeremy Overstreet, it could account for the lack of forced entry. So the search for Overstreet took on a new significance. When questioned, Overstreet's girlfriend, Holly Doyle, said she bought Overstreet four shirts, and one of them was missing. She described it as a green, tan, and a red plaid uh, short sleeve shirt. Holly bought the shirt at an Eddie Bauer store just a few miles away. She immediately went to the men's department, a particular clothing section. She looked around, said, this is it. She picked it out of all the other shirts that were, this is the one I bought him, this is the one that's missing. And I asked her, are you sure about this? She said, yes, I'm sure. The buttons on this shirt appeared to be identical to the button found at the crime scene. Everything was kind of falling into place. Everything was going in the direction that we needed to go in order to solve, solve this case. Police scoured the inside of Julie's apartment for any signs of forensic evidence that would link Overstreet to the crime. Unfortunately, they couldn't find any. They also couldn't find Jeremy Overstreet. You could tell by looking at Ben, and I'm sure he could tell by looking at me, that our stress level was about at 100%. One week later, because of his credit card activity, police found Overstreet in a San Jose hotel 150 miles west of Fresno. Police had nothing concrete to tie him to Julie's murder, but were still able to arrest him. We had him in custody for parole violation, but nothing else. We had time on our side to work the Julie Brown case 100%.
In his wallet, Overstreet had one of Julie Braun's business cards. What he had was a trophy. It wasn't a business card for business purposes. It was a trophy to stamp another victim in his book. During his interrogation by police, Overstreet wouldn't say where he put his Eddie Bauer shirt. One of those shirts was gone, and also a pair of pants were gone. Jeremy had no explanation for where they were, or why they were missing. And that's consistent with somebody who had slashed Julie, stabbed Julie, and had blood on her clothes. And I wasn't going to wash out, not with that crime scene. He had to get rid of them. On Overstreet's right hand, investigators noticed a large healing scar across his knuckles. It sure looked an awful lot like a knife had gone down that knuckle. But investigators didn't find Overstreet's blood or any other forensic evidence at the crime scene. Investigators needed more than a shirt button to charge Overstreet with murder and feared he could walk free. The prime suspect in Julianne Braun's murder was her next door neighbor, Jeremy Overstreet, who had a previous conviction for rape and robbery. Investigators didn't find Overstreet's blood in Julie's apartment, despite the fact that he had a recent wound on his right hand. So investigators decided to look for evidence in Overstreet's apartment. We did notice some items of clothing that belonged to Mr. Overstreet. Those were taken as evidence, uh, but none of them were the clothing that we were looking for. But with so much blood at the crime scene, investigators paid particular attention to anything that resembled blood in Overstreet's apartment. We observed these small brownish colored specks, one on the bathroom door and a couple on the cabinet below the sink and one cross on, a, on the opposite wall. A phenolphthalein test showed it was human blood. We can work with very, very small amounts of DNA. I've always said that if it's sort of pin-sized, uh, I can see it, that I can get a profile. But scientists didn't find just one DNA profile. They found a mixture of two female donors. One was from Holly Doyle, which made sense because she also lived in the apartment. Which could have been simply from her touching the door. The other was compared to Julie Braun's DNA. The DNA that I extracted and um, typed from the bathroom door, in my opinion, came from Julie Braun. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. It was a home run, if there ever was a home run. In fact, the odds were one in 2.3 trillion that it was anyone but Julie Braun. And I was told that the DNA belonged to Julie. Words can't describe the feeling that came over me, uh, that came over us in, in the unit. There's only one way her blood got into his, his bathroom, and that was because he was at the scene at the time. Jeremy Overstreet admitted being inside Julie's apartment. He said she was giving him advice on how to get a car loan since she worked in the finance field. An unbelievable story. You know, you have no job, but you, you're going to go to go talk to this person who's in charge of financing to get financing for a car. Let's be real here. Overstreet denied any involvement in her murder, but he couldn't explain the blood. In July of 1999, Jeremy Overstreet was charged with first-degree murder and attempted rape. He gave her the same choice that he gave his victim from Southern California. You can either have sex with me or you can die. 
The choice is yours. Prosecutors believe Overstreet was hunting for victims and that the apartment manager's wife may have been a target. Fortunately for her, she didn't take the bait. It really won't take long at all. You don't have a, a quick moment to go back and... No, I don't, but I can, I can see maybe it's okay. Three nights later, prosecutors say Overstreet conned his way into Julie's apartment with a story about financing a car. At 7.30 p.m., Julie's mother called the apartment. And that's when Julie told her mother that she had company, one of her neighbors. At some point, Overstreet grabbed a steak knife and ordered her to undress. Instead, Julie tried to get to the front door. There was a fight, and she ripped the button from his shirt. Overstreet was much bigger than Julie, and without a weapon, she had no chance. He stabbed her repeatedly, spattering himself with her blood. He washed some of it off in the kitchen, then grabbed one of her business cards as a trophy. He then went back to his own apartment to clean up, and some of Julie's blood landed on the door. This cross-transfer of Julie's blood and a button from a shirt like one Overstreet owned led to only one conclusion. Jeremy Overstreet was the killer. Jeremy didn't need to rape Julie Braun. He had an exotic dancer, a beautiful woman, who he could have had sex with just by asking. This wasn't about wanting to have sex. This was wanting to dominate her, to use force on her. It was a crime of violence. How could someone do that? Why would someone do that? It's disgusting. Why would someone want that? Why would someone try to do that? Why would anyone want to have other people go through what they would go through? On March 1st, 2003, Jeremy Overstreet was convicted of first-degree murder, attempted rape, and burglary. At his sentencing, Julie's family had some words for her killer. I hate you, but I'm not going to let that take control of me. Because I'm not that kind of person. I'm stronger than you, and my mother was stronger than you. And you know it. I felt sick just speaking to him. I kept looking at Jeremy Overstreet. And then all I could see was his glim, glum face smirking. And then he looked down sometimes. A button and a speck of blood told the story. A jury heard it and sentenced Jeremy Overstreet to two life sentences with no possibility of parole. This guy isn't part of my friends, but an evil bastard, and I'm relieved he's going to go to prison for the rest of his life. You can try as hard as you want to to cover all your bases, but with forensics and what it's becoming on a day-to-day -day basis, you better be awful damn good to get rid of everything because that little speck of blood was Julie's blood, and I could prove it. They always say that God works in mysterious ways. I believe that the button was put there, was left there for us to find and for us to continue on our investigation and let us in the right direction.